It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Philips 436 M6 VBPAB. The OSD is controlled by a few methods. There is a joystick at the rear of the monitor at the right side and it's a massive stretch. It's very annoying to use and I don't think I've actually used that more than once um, despite having used this monitor for a couple of weeks or so now. But there is fortunately an alternative method, this nice controller here, very much like you get on the TV, an infrared controller, an infrared remote. Much prefer this, much easier, um, saves you having to stretch over. But if you do want to use the joystick, and you can see a picture of the little joystick um, in the review, you can uh, twiddle that upwards and it allows you to change the input source. If you twiddle it to the left, you've got your smart image game, and I'll go through this shortly. Menu. To the right, you've got the main menu. Down, you can quickly adjust the volume. There's also a power LED, power indicator, towards the bottom right, which is a kind of long, oblong shape. Um, that just glows a gentle white when the monitor's on, and it uh, flashes if the monitor's on standby. There's a little message that comes on the screen. I don't know if you saw that. Um, when you first turn the monitor on, and it's just telling you to comply with energy standards. The USB ports are deactivated when the monitor's in a low power state, in standby. Um, but you can turn that on or off, that feature, in the OSD, as I'll come on to shortly. So the controller, which is by far my preferred method for controlling the OSD, it's got a power button at the top there, source select, menu, navigation and OK which uh, enters the main menu if you just press that alone or acts as an enter key depending on where you are on the menu. There's a little smart image game uh, button which allows you to change the uh, quickly select one of the smart image game presets. So there are various presets, most of these are explored in the review. Um, I don't, to be honest, I don't actually find most of them very good, but this is often the case with presets because I've got a keen eye for colour and I don't like uh, things to look messed up, which is what these presets do for the most part. Um, Gamer, 1, Gamer 1 and Gamer 2 um, probably some of the slightly less obnoxious ones, but to be honest this monitor is very nicely calibrated uh, when you've got smart image game disabled and you get good flexibility there so off is a setting I prefer but there's also low blue mode which is a low blue light setting which I explore in the review and that is useful and I use that myself sometimes. There's a smart uniformity setting which is also explored in the review and that is a digital uniformity compensation setting. doesn't work very well at least not on my unit and there's off which is my preferred setting for my test settings so and there are just various different presets you can use. And then there's a, a back button. You can also quickly control the brightness of the screen or the volume of the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5mm jack. So the brightness control in particular I find quite useful. Um, this is a bit different to a TV brightness control or your typical TV brightness control. It's more like um, a backlight control that you might have on a TV. Uh, so it doesn't control the digital brightness, it actually controls the backlight brightness. The main menu has various different sections. The first is Ambiglow, which controls the ambient light feature of the monitor. So if you turn this on, the various different settings. If you've got Ambiglow on itself, uh, just as Ambiglow rather than Auto Mode or User Define, it will change uh, shade or colour slightly depending on the content being displayed. So there's bright, brighter, brightest, so you can control how bright the LEDs are as well. You'll see them flickering on the video because they do use pulse width modulation unlike the monitor itself. Um, but in, in reality most users won't see them flickering, it's not at a bothersome frequency. Most users find that kind of LED lighting fine but um, you can control the brightness, so that was bright, this is brighter, or this brightest. And you can see the LEDs at the rear 
uh, sorry, at the bottom even. So there's uh, 10, 10 LEDs there. I was just having to count them, couldn't remember how many there were. And they do quite a good job at illuminating the area, especially if the room's a bit darker as it is now. And you can, can certainly notice them. I personally don't find the actual ambiglow setting, which adjusts according to the desktop environment um, or, or whatever image you're showing, your game, whatever it might be. I don't find that particularly useful. Um, I don't really... Often I find it's kind of just slightly off-white, no matter what the uh, scene is displaying. And I wouldn't say I find it distracting necessarily, but I don't really find it adds anything in terms of immersion or anything like that. But you can actually manually control the ambiglow setting, which I prefer to do. Um, oh, there's also auto mode, and this just cycles through various colours. So it's a bit like the kind of store display mode which kind of looks cool or if you're showing the monitor off to people it's a bit rainbowy and again you can have that all set to brightest brighter or bright depending on your preferences but user define now this quite impressed me i, I thought maybe you could change it uh, to red green and blue and white perhaps or something like that but no there are lots of different options you can have it set to white or red Rose, magenta, violet, blue, azure, cyan, aquamarine, green, chartreuse, and yellow. They won't look accurate on the video, it depends on various things, but uh, still you can see there's a good variety of different colours. I tend to, oh and there's also orange, sorry, just last but not least there's orange, which kind of just blends into my desk quite nicely. I, yeah, depending on my mood, I like to choose a different uh, colour. I tend to use red. I don't think, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm in an angry mood. I just find it kind of relaxing. If I'm using the monitor in a dark room, which is usually in the evening, um, I don't tend to have the lights off, but even so, I find it uh, nice to have the ambi glow set to red. Next, there's low blue mode. If you enable this, there are four different levels. So you can have it set to level 1, which is the weakest, level 2, which is a bit stronger in terms of the blue light reduction, level 3, or level 4. And for my own purposes in the evening, for relaxing evening viewing, I do use 4. I don't use this for my testing specifically, but it's just for my own benefit, just like the red ambi glow. That's just how I like things in the evening. There's low blue mode, and this allows you to activate the low blue light settings. There are four different options available. One being the weakest effect, two being a bit uh, stronger in terms of its blue light reduction, three being a little stronger again, and four being the strongest. I like to use four uh, for my own purposes in the evening. Um, not for my testing, but just for my own viewing comfort. It's good to minimise blue light output from the monitor in the evening or the hours leading up towards bed. Um, you can read a bit more about that in the review. Next there's input and that allows you to select the input source used by the monitor. So as you can see at the moment I'm using DisplayPort. Picture, this allows you to select which HDR option is used. Um, and that's when the monitor actually detects an HDR signal and it'll automatically switch to whatever HDR mode you've got set there and they're all explored in the review. You can change the brightness, contrast, sharpness, and the sharpness is changed in increments of 10. I find the default 50 to be optimal. Smart response, again explored in the review, there's off, fast, faster or fastest. I very much recommend off, or if you really have to, fast, but uh, I generally recommend off. Smart contrast, um, that's a dynamic contrast setting which is explored in the review. Uh, it sort of melts the eyeballs. Um, don't like it, don't really like dynamic contrast anyway, so that's not saying much. Next, the smart frame, and I've just turned to the RTS mode because that's one of the presets that actually uses this. Generally, it's greyed out. Um, this allows you to have a little box on the screen just to help highlight that area. For example, your map in an RTS game. Well, that's So uh, that's why it's associated with the RTS mode. And you can change the size, the brightness of the area, um, the contrast, 
horizontal position, vertical position. Obviously that's not the backlight brightness, it's just a digital brightness control, so it's very different. I'm going to turn the RTS uh, mode off before my eyeballs melt. So as you can see, when you're cycling through the presets, um, it can be a bit laggy. It actually activates the presets fully before you can cycle to the next one. But the, generally the menu is perfectly responsive. Next is Gamma, and that has various different Gamma settings are explored in the review. Don't take them at face value because I measured quite different uh, values to what it actually says here. Next is Pixel Orbiting, and what that does is it is designed to reduce image retention. I didn't have any image retention issues in my testing with this monitor, and I did just leave Pixel Orbiting on, which is the default. And that just, every now and then, it just nudges um, the image by one pixel and then back again to where it was before, just to kind of jolt them into a different position and uh, try and reduce image retention. It's a common feature on quite a lot of Philips displays, especially larger ones, but um, Philips TVs and other TVs as well. There's overscan, and that applies if you're using sort of older things. It's not relevant to modern systems, so I wouldn't really worry about that setting. PIP, P by P, picture in picture, picture by picture. You can have PIP, which displays one source there and the other source for the rest of the screen. As you can see, I've only got one uh, input, so it's just duplicating that, which is kind of pointless. But if I had a different uh, source connected, I could watch a film up there or whatever it might be that you want to do. Uh, and you can you can you can change the um, input source used, the the size, the position, or you can swap the sources. There's also a P by P, picture by picture. And again, I've only got one thing connected, so it's just duplicating it there. So it's just got one source to the left, one to the right, with a black border around it. Or you can change the resolution, as it was suggesting there, to uh, have the sources so they fill the entire screen. And it only supports uh, two sources. It doesn't. Some displays would have four sources. Um, or multiple sources, more than two, but this, this display only supports two independent sources for its picture by picture. Next up, the smart size, and this is actually greyed out if you're using DisplayPort. I originally thought it was greyed out because I was using an AMD FreeSync compatible GPU, but um, when I hooked up my NVIDIA GPU, as I've, I've got hooked up now, I was using DisplayPort again, and this was completely greyed out. Uh, I switched to HDMI 2, and the smart size menu seems to be available now, so it seems to be that it's something that you can access over HDMI but not DisplayPort. The default setting is panel size, uh, 43 inch wide, 16 by 9, so that is what this uh, screen is. But you can select one of various emulation settings, which will change it to various screen sizes and aspect ratios. So there's 27 inch 16 by 9. Um, I'm not sure how clear it is because the black depth is very good on this monitor, but there is actually a black border around the uh, the image, and it just shows a 27 inch uh, image. And there are various other settings as well. Some are a 16 by 10 as well, 22 inch 16 by 10, for example. So because this is uh, because of the resolution I'm using. Everything looks squashed up and weird because it's a 16 by 9 resolution, but I've, I've just selected a 16 by 10 aspect ratio in the smart size setting. So it's more to use if, you, if you're using various non-native resolutions and you want things to appear correct based on the aspect ratio or a specific screen size as well. The one-to-one -one setting, one-to-one -one pixel mapping. So if you run the monitor at its native resolution as I'm doing now, you won't notice any difference with that. If you change the resolution to something else, such as Full HD, and you've got the one-to-one -one pixel mapping setting used, you'll see that uh, it only uses the pixels called for in the resolution you've selected, and gives a big black border around the image instead. So that's for Full HD. You could also select uh, 2560 by 1440 WQHD and you'll get a smaller black border around the image uh, but there's no distortion at all, everything's displayed 
uh, as it would be natively, just with a big black border for the rest of the screen space and pixels. And finally there is an aspect setting, and what this is supposed to do is, well what it's supposed to do is respect the aspect ratio of the resolution you're running, but I'm running the native resolution 3840 by 2160 and for some reason it's all squished up. Uh, I have no idea why it's done that. I'll select Full HD and see what happens. And again it's all squished up and the aspect ratio is all wrong. So I've got absolutely no idea why it's doing that. It seems to be a, a bit of a, a bug or something. Audio, that allows you to change the volume of the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5mm jack. Standalone, um, not sure what that does. I never bothered to look that up and I've come across this every time I review Philips monitors. I, I really don't know what that does, I'm sure it says in the manual. Mute does what you'd expect, mutes the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5mm jack. Audio source, you can change the input source used. DTS, and that's just a sound technology which the monitor speakers support and it just makes the sound a bit richer and stuff like that. If you turn that off, you can actually adjust things. The graphic equaliser settings essentially can adjust different frequency responses. And mobile phone, I'm assuming that is something to do with MHL or something if you've got uh, a mobile phone connected via HDMI or perhaps USB. I'm not sure because I don't and I haven't played with this feature. But I find the speakers quite decent with their uh, DTS on at least. I mean, they're not amazing, but they're perfectly decent for integrated speakers. Colour, that allows you to change the colour menu. There are various preset values. Uh, I find 6500K very good on my unit, so I use that. There's an sRGB setting, which is actually a colour space emulation setting, which reduces the saturation of the image considerably. You can use a define, which allows you to change the red, green and blue colour channels manually. Next is language which just changes the language that the OSD is displayed in. OSD settings, so you can change the horizontal or vertical position of the OSD as it appears on the screen. You can enable or disable a transparency effect and change the level of that effect. So you can practically not read it if you want. If you're a bit strange, but um, there's OSD timeout, which is how long the OSD will appear on the screen after the last button press before automatically disappearing. You can, of course, just exit it manually the usual way by using the back button. And finally, there is setup. You can have a resolution notification on the screen, which means if you're running a non-native resolution, such as Full HD, it'll just give you a reminder that the optimal native resolution is 3840 by 2160. USB, that allows you to change the USB mode between USB 3 and USB 2. USB standby mode, and that was the thing I was mentioning before, it gives you a message on the screen, and this just allows you to say whether you want the USB ports to be active when the monitor's on standby, so it slightly increases the power consumption, the energy consumption of the monitor, only slightly. There's a low input lag setting. This is greyed out if you're using DisplayPort, but it's actually automatically enabled with DisplayPort, um, so it just means you can't disable it, so you don't have to worry about it. With HDMI, um, you can select this setting, it's actually off by default, but I would just leave it switched on. I didn't notice any degradation in image quality or other issues whilst having this enabled um, using HDMI. CEC, I can't remember off the top of my head what that stands for, but it's something about um, allowing devices to control the monitor via HDMI, so you can control the OSD via HDMI, stuff like that. You can reset everything to the factory defaults. And there's a little information section which shows you the model, the serial number, and the current resolution and refresh rate being used. So that's all there is to the OSD on screen display menu system of the Philips 436 VBPAB.
Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video. And there's also a link to information about how you can support the work that we do.